A final farewell from her sons for Princess Diana. She needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. And the people's princess is buried in a private cer ceremony at the Spencer family home. Good evening. Princess Diana was laid to rest today after an extraordinary day which saw two million people line the streets of London to say a last goodbye. Prince Charles, Princes William and Harry walked behind the gun carriage carrying the princess's body to Westminster Abbey. During the service, the princess's brother described Diana as the most hunted person of the modern age. And in a thinly disguised criticism of Britain's royal family, he said he and his sisters would play a role in the upbringing of the young princess. <laughs> They had come not just from Britain, but from all over the world, simply to be close to her and to be part of these final moments. As the tenor bell of Westminster Abbey tolled, under the clear blue morning sky, the gun carriage bore the princess's coffin away from her home at Kensington Palace for the last time, marching alongside the bearers from the Welsh Guards. Until last Tuesday, these men had been on patrol in South Armagh. As the cortege moved into the Mall, outside Buckingham Palace, the Queen and other members of the royal family stood looking on silently. With them, her close friend and former sister-in-law, Sarah Ferguson. A little further down the Mall, at St James's Palace, were waiting her two young sons, William and Harry, with their father and grandfather. And for the two boys, the beginning of what must have been the biggest public ordeal of the day, the walk behind their mother's coffin for the final slow mile to Westminster Abbey. They were not alone. Behind them, 500 representatives of the charities with which Diana was associated. It took nearly two hours from Kensington Palace to the Abbey for the start of a remarkable service to celebrate a remarkable life. It was this hymn, I Vow to Thee, My Country, which was sung at her wedding to Prince Charles. The Prime Minister, Tony Blair, read from Corinthians. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now, I know in part but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Goodbye, little rose. May you ever grow in our hearts. You are the grace that placed yourselves where lives were torn apart. Elton John sang a specially rewritten version of Candle in the Wind. And you whispered to those in pain, now you belong. And the stars spell out your name. There followed a remarkable and pointed tribute from Diana's younger brother, Earl Spencer. A very British girl who's con who transcended nationality. Someone with a natural nobility who was classless and who proved in the last year that she needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate and I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. The applause was spontaneous, unplanned, and as with so much else today, it was unprecedented.
And as the Welsh guards bore her outside to the hearse, it had indeed been a unique occasion for a unique person. Diana moved through the streets of London, heading north to her final resting place on the Spencer estate at Althorpe in Northamptonshire. It seemed as if she had truly become at last the Queen of Hearts. As forecast, millions did turn out for Diana's final day. The crowds started gathering on Friday and camped overnight on the streets. Even those who couldn't watch firsthand gathered in their thousands at Hyde Park, where huge TV screens had been specially erected. Early morning in London saw thousands waking up in their sleeping bags, having camped overnight to ensure they would have a good vantage spot in which to view the proceedings. Even though it had been a cold, damp night, no one seemed to mind. By half past seven, every possible position was taken up along the two-mile route from Diana's home in Kensington to Westminster Abbey. Those who didn't want to risk missing it went to Hyde Park, where large screens were erected. And it was here that the silence was first broken in earnest, with the hundreds of thousands present rising to their feet after Earl Spencer's moving and pointed speech. The 1900 specially invited guests for the funeral service began arriving at Westminster Abbey shortly after 8 o'clock. Among them were the princess's special friends. From the world of music, Pavarotti, who looked visibly shaken. Elton John, who sang so movingly, arrived with fellow musician George Michael. From the world of business, airline boss Richard Branson. From international politics, Henry Kissinger. And from the acting world, Tom Conti. Others in attendance included former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, political wives Bernadette Chirac and Hillary Clinton, filmmaker Richard Attenborough, TV show host Clive James. But this wasn't a day for the famous. It was a day for the ordinary people. And for some, it was all too much. She was our princess. And she always will be. I just, I wish that my mum was here to see as well. Manny brought their children so that they could tell them in years to come that they were here. Diana was a very special lady, I think, to, to so many people, and I think it's just right that we should pay our respects. And it's good that George, although he doesn't understand now, he's so young, but it's good that we should come and see. For one little boy, he didn't know why she was special. He just knew that she was. I don't know, I just liked her. But it wasn't just in the city that the crowds turned out. Almost all the way from London to the princess's family home in Northamptonshire, they were there, throwing flowers at the hearse as it rolled by. Just after half past three this afternoon, the public part of the proceedings came to an end. While the burial was a private family affair, the public were still there in spirit. As night falls here in London, it's the end of a day unparalleled. Even though Diana is now buried, the public still mourn. And at Kensington Palace, they are queuing to sign books of condolences. It's a day that will have lasting memories, not just for the millions who turned out here, but for the hundreds of millions around the world who watched. In Dublin, flags flew at half-mast as a mark of respect and many city centre shops remained closed during the funeral, while in Belfast, the streets were almost completely deserted. Today was supposed to be party day in Dublin city centre, but the carnival to mark the end of President Robinson's term of office was cancelled. Instead, the mood was subdued. As the clocks struck 11, shoppers and staff in the shops that were open observed a minute silence, marking the arrival at Westminster Abbey of the funeral cortege. Again at a quarter to 12, another minute silence. Um, Chicago mourns her. We, she came to visit us and raised money for breast cancer um, last year, and we will miss her. Yes, I think we're all united in our grief, both for Princess Diana and for Mother Teresa today. Diana crossed international borders, and uh, we appreciate the Irish people. We saw the uh, Irish trickle at half-mast earlier, and uh, I think we appreciate that.
Flags flew at half-mast on public buildings including Leinster House and the GPO, the first such gesture for a British national since the assassination of Lord Mountbatten in 1979. Outside the mansion house, slow airs for Diana as the morning continued. One lady suggested we all light a candle at 20 to 8 on Saturday night in our homes and when the sun sets, we'll all be doing that. Now we're selling an awful lot of sunflowers because that means sun, right? So we find that this is like happiness. That's what your Diane brought to the people. Across Northern Ireland, streets were virtually deserted as people stayed at home to watch live broadcasts of the funeral. Some chose to mourn collectively, as in St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. Quietness along the Falls Road and the Shank Hill showed both communities at a standstill. In the United States, millions of Americans watched the funeral on television rising before dawn to follow the coverage. All week, people have been queuing outside the British Embassy in Washington and consulates across the country to sign books of condolence. The last journey of a princess was beamed into the heart of New York City just after daybreak. Even in the early morning hustle and bustle of Times Square, people took a moment to stop and stare. Right across America, there's been an unexpected outpouring of emotion after Diana's death, emotion that cuts across barriers of class and creed. Here at the British Consulate in New York, 10,000 people have signed a book of condolence, and thousands more have left floral tributes. But I could not believe that in New York, or in the cities of the United States, that this would have happened, and I'm very, very glad it did. She has touched lives in ways that she will never know, but we will continue to have her in our memories and may she rest in peace. We thank you, Diana, for lighting up our lives, and we will continue your journey. Ellery and Monica. Part of Diana's appeal in America was the tragic drama of her life, but there was something else. And I think there's something uh, about her that has really touched all New Yorkers, and that is the way in which she used her position and she used her popularity to help people who were in need. Next weekend, Princess Diana will be remembered at a religious service in Central Park, a chance for New Yorkers to publicly express a grief that is felt right across the United States. This country was captivated by Diana's life and feels deep sorrow at her passing. Americans have no royal family, but they took this British princess to their hearts and they will mourn her as if she were one of their own. Well, Brian O'Connell, our correspondent, joins me now from London. Brian, what do you make of Earl Spencer's comments, particularly his remarks in relation to the two young princes? They were unprecedented, they were unexpected. This is a very, very angry man. He obviously blames the media for his sister's death and he blames the royal family for making it such a miserable life. Uh, I think it's going to have enormous effect here. Maybe uh, at the moment, obviously, all the newspapers are going to report it for days and days, but it's not going to be forgotten quite simply because Diana won't be forgotten. They're going to turn her into a legend and her son is going to sit on the throne one day. And King William, according to his uncle Charles Spencer, is going to be protected both from the media by him and also from the tradition being immersed by the duty and tradition, he said, uh, of the royal family. That's quite a swipe at the royal family and it's completely unprecedented. Well, as you said, it is very soon after the event, but what do you think will be the long-term impact of all of this on Britain's royal family? Well, the Queen in her special broadcast yesterday said lessons had to be learnt, and Charles Spencer said the same thing as well. And I think the royal family has learned a very, very hard lesson this week. The long-term impact of it is that the British royal family must stay more closely in touch with its people. It seems too remote, uh, too aloof, too, too arrogant, perhaps, wouldn't Bri be too strong a word, and I think that's the lesson. Brian, if I could interrupt you, um, what is the scene in London tonight? Tonight, Una, some people have gone home, but people seem reluctant to go home. They seem reluctant to let go of Diana. They're still wandering around the streets, around Parliament Square, where the cortege came to Westminster Abbey, looking at flowers, reading some of the messages, perhaps, uh, before they, they go home. They're not in the pubs. They're not drinking to Diana or anything like that. They're just quietly with their thoughts, wandering around the streets, staring quite blankly. Really, They just don't want to let her go. OK, Brian O'Connell in London, thank you very much for talking to us. Well, there we take a break. Coming up, Mother Teresa is to begin the Ireland victory in Iceland. Welcome back. 
programme on RTE Radio 1 at 1. More on the deaths of two of the world's most famous women and assessments of their legacies. But before we leave you, we take a look back on the images of the day on which Diana, Princess of Wales, was laid to rest. And it seems to me you've lived your life like a candle in the wind Never fading with the sunset when the rain set in Footsteps will always fall here along England's greenest hills. Your candles burned out long before your legend ever will.